The thief on the cross is the way that he's known. And it's surprising how well he's known, how little face time he gets in Scripture. Only in one scene, that one scene is recorded by all four gospel writers. So many people know a little bit of something at least about the thief on the cross. But maybe we don't know enough about him because we get it backwards. More telling than the thief on the cross is the cross on the thief. Lots and lots of people were crucified in the Roman Empire. And the New Testament only tells us about three people who were crucified. And they were crucified all at once. It's Jesus and these two men who were crucified on either side of him. But there's one cross, and not really just the cross itself, but, but what happened at the cross, what Jesus accomplished at the cross, that's called the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 tells us that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 says that it's the word of the cross that saves us. So when we talk about the cross, we're talking about the cross of Christ, but not the two pieces of wood that form that cross, rather what Jesus did when he died on that cross. The thief just happens to be there at ground zero for all of it. Let's pick up some of that scene in Luke chapter 23, if you'll open your Bibles with me. Luke chapter 23, verse 32. Awful, terrible things had been going on for Jesus for the last 12 hours or so. Verse 32, it says, Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the ruler scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he's the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you're under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. When I read this, I wonder about the thief. The one who comes into focus beginning in verse 40. I wonder about the thief because we know very little about him. All we know is what's found here and in the parallel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and John. And they don't say much more than Luke does. I wonder, what was his name? Everybody knows him as the thief on the cross, but there were two thieves on crosses either side of Jesus. But what was his name? There's a tradition about what his name was, but it doesn't go nearly far enough back to really matter. 
You know, when you read the Gospels, and unless you're told otherwise that somebody's a, a Samaritan or, or they're Roman or, or something, when you encounter somebody in the Gospels, we're supposed to just assume this is a Jew. He's a Jew, she's a Jew. And among the Jews, much more than among us, when parents gave a child a name, that name had meaning in it. Of course, the best example is Jesus himself. He, his earthly parents were told, you name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. And Jesus means Savior. Well, what was this man's name? Had his parents given him a good name? And had he betrayed that name? I wonder about his family. Assuming him to be a Jew, did he get a good name? Moral and, and religious upbringing that he just totally wasted in his adult life. I wonder if he was a married man. In his crime, had he carelessly left behind a wife and children? I wonder what exactly he had done. Luke calls the men crucified alongside Jesus criminals in verse 32. In verse 39 that we read, or, or malefactors, your King James Version would say. The word which Luke used in Greek, kurgos, refers to people who commit gross misdeeds and crimes. This wasn't any petty thief. Matthew and Mark call these criminals robbers, a different Greek word, lestes, and robbers then as now are distinguished from mere thieves in that they add violence to their pilfering. Barabbas was a robber. That's what he's called in John 18, 40. And we learn here a few verses earlier in Luke chapter 23, verse 19, that Barabbas was an insurrectionist and a murderer. At least that's what he was imprisoned for. I wonder if these men crucified alongside Jesus had a connection to Barabbas. Were they the, the Barabbas gang, perhaps, in Palestine? Were they all three supposed to be crucified together that day? Whatever he had done, this guy admitted in the words that we read from his own mouth that he was guilty of crime worthy of capital punishment. I wonder how he got to the point of saying all these things that he said to his fellow criminal and to Jesus in verses 40 and following. And I wonder that especially because he began the day as the other criminal did, jumping on the run Jesus down bandwagon. And there was a big one there at the scene of the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse 44 says, In the same way the robbers, plural, who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. So we hear the one in Luke's text saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Verse 39. Well, according to Matthew and Mark, it wasn't just that robber who started out saying those kinds of things. This one, the thief on the cross, as we call him, was saying the same kinds of things earlier in the day. You think about that. You're hanging on a cross. You're about to die, and you know it. And you're losing, or using your belabored breath to say those kinds of things to somebody else who's hanging on a cross next to you? Why wouldn't you be praying to God knowing that you're about to meet Him? How in the space of hours or less, though, did that man go from that to this? And I'll read it again, beginning in verse 40. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God? since you're under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. 
And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What all do we see in what he said? Well, we can enumerate these things. He believed in God because he, he asked his fellow criminal, do you not fear God? He believed in a standard of right and wrong because he said Jesus hasn't done anything wrong, but we have. He believed that he had violated that standard. He believed that he deserved the punishment that he was getting. He was afraid of what was coming next. That's implicit in his words when he asked the other, Do you not fear God? He believed Jesus hadn't done anything wrong. And somehow, for some reason, he believed that even after this fatal day, he saw where this was going with Jesus, even after this fatal day, Jesus would have a kingdom and could bless him. Now, I wonder, how did he know what he knew about Jesus? I think with some time we could easily make the case that, that he could conclude many of those things from what he was seeing in his experience that day. But he seems to know too much for that to be the whole story. For four years, the, the good news of, of Christ and the kingdom of God had been spreading through Palestine. Do you think sometime over the last four years... He'd heard that good news. Do you think he might have even met Jesus before? Or John the Baptist who was preaching that message? Or one of the apostles or 70 other people that Jesus sent out preaching the good news? Or any of the other people who had encountered Jesus and couldn't help but tell other people about what they had seen? and about what they had heard when they had been with Jesus. Had he heard all of it, you think, and discounted it until now? Or had he heard it before and believed in Jesus? And had he been baptized by John or one of the apostles? They were doing that for people, you know. John chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 tell about John baptizing people for repentance unto remission of sins. And the disciples were going out and baptizing people in behalf of Jesus, surely for the same reasons. John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Do you think maybe this man had been baptized and he turned his life around? and then turned himself in? And that's why he's where he is now? Do you think maybe he had believed and, and been baptized, but grown impatient after once accepting the truth about Jesus and done something that was anything but consistent with his belief in Jesus? If he'd already been exposed to the preaching of Christ and the kingdom, he couldn't have expected to see Jesus on a cross beside him that day. And whether it be out of disappointment or disowning his faith in Jesus, then whenever they're first erected on those crosses, all those words come spilling out against Jesus. Maybe that's the way it happened. I don't know. I wonder. But Scripture just does not say. On the other hand, I'm struck with wonder at what Scripture does say. I'm struck with wonder over the love and mercy and grace of God in this whole scene. It's on full display in this passage. In the paragraphs that preceded the ones that, that we have read, Jesus endures all kinds of... Of, of treachery, betrayal, denial, injustice before those who hold power, abuse physically, mockery, 
torture by scourging, and finally the nailing of his body to a cross. In the paragraph that follows the one that, that we have read, he finally calls out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. But before that, in the paragraphs that we have read, Jesus prayed in verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's what Jesus was all about. And that's what this was all about, where Jesus hung on a cross. About eight centuries in advance, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, painted the scene for us. It said that he, the, the Messiah to come, it's as good as done in, in the mind of God when Isaiah writes it. So he says, he poured out his soul to death and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and he makes intercession for the transgressors. So the Bible makes it no surprise when Jesus was crucified between two criminals. He was numbered with the transgressors. The Bible tells us what he was doing there. And then the New Testament interprets so vividly for us, not just what was happening to Jesus, but what Jesus was doing on the cross. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. All of this is according to the determinant counsel and foreknowledge of God, as, as Peter said on the day of Pentecost. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, Paul writes, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. When we read about that scene in Luke chapter 23, we hear Jesus praying for the people who were doing it to him. For the people who did not believe. For the people who kept making it worse and worse and worse of a scene that it seems it even had to be. Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 6. But... Throughout this passage we just read, there are some repeated pronouns by which Paul identifies the people for whom Jesus died. It was for those people who were there that day. At the foot of the cross, standing a little further away on either side of him on crosses. But verse 6 here says, it's while we were still weak. In verse 8, God shows his love for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And now we've been justified by his blood, verse 9. And we will be saved by him from the wrath of God. Revelation 1, verse 5 says, He has freed us from our sins by his blood. So blood. You can read again and again in the New Testament about the blood of Christ. Maybe as often as you read that, that he died. Whenever we read about the blood of Christ, that doesn't mean just that he bled, like you and I have bled. You and I have bled, but we haven't died bleeding yet. When the Bible speaks of his blood, it's talking about his death. If he had bled like you and I have without dying, we'd be no better off. As we sometimes sing, there was one who was willing to die in my place that a soul so unworthy might live. 
what that humbled man dying beside Jesus wanted that only Jesus could offer was forgiveness, and that's what he got. So that Jesus could say, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I just can't forget William Barclay's description of the origin of that word paradise. Now it's used throughout Scripture as an inviting picture for us but Barclay wrote, the word paradise is a Persian word, meaning a walled garden. When a Persian king wished to do one of his subjects a very special honor, he made him a companion of the garden, which meant he was chosen to walk in the garden with the king. It was more than immortality that Jesus promised the penitent thief. He promised him the honored place of a companion of the garden in the courts of heaven. Isn't that inviting? Today you will be with me in paradise. Wasn't it good for that robber to hear? It's about to get better for you. You'll be in paradise. But not just that, you'll be with me in paradise. Now think about what he had done. Even though we don't know exactly what he had done, He's called a criminal. He's called a robber. And he says, I'm getting what I deserve. And Jesus can forgive a man like that. Finally and forever. Jesus can forgive that kind of man. And if he can forgive that kind of man, he can forgive us whatever we have done. He has the authority. And he has the heart to do it. The unfathomable love, the marvelous mercy, the amazing grace to grant us forgiveness of all of our sins, everything that we have ever done. Aren't you struck with wonder over that? But then with our last line of thought, I'm not left to wonder what to do about that, and neither are you. When it was all done and, and Jesus had gone to sit on his throne in heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to help the apostles tell it just right. And that's what they did on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Peter told what happened that day to Jesus. And he told what Jesus did that day that he died. And he told about the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And he told his original listeners what had to happen that day that they were listening to him. And he tells us what still has to happen today. In Acts chapter 2, his sermon came to a head in verse 36 when he said, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. His original listeners didn't get the wonder of it yet. Instead, the Bible says that they were cut to the heart. They were pierced in their hearts. They were stabbed in their hearts by what they heard. In verse 37, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. That's right. There's forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus Christ for every believer who repents and is baptized. And the commands that, that Peter issued still bind, and the promise still holds for all of us, those who are far off, as we're described in verse 39. The Holy Spirit would later give Peter these words, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, and, and then verse 21. He wrote, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. And then in verse 21, 
Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I read there, baptism now saves you. Peter's word, the Holy Spirit's word, baptism now saves you. But someone will say, well, I just asked Jesus to save me, just like the thief did. Jesus told that thief, today you'll be with me in paradise, and it's going to be the same for me. Baptism doesn't have anything to do with it, he might say. And then I would say, I don't know if the thief was baptized or not. But that was then, and this is now. Baptism now saves you. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism brings together in my life the most important things that have ever happened. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. Paul said, I delivered to you as of first importance that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Paul says nothing is more important than that. But when the thief asked and Jesus answered, Jesus wasn't dead yet. He wasn't buried yet. He wasn't raised from the dead yet. But now, Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. When Jesus and that sin-sick soul hung on crosses beside each other, Jesus had not said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. He hadn't said it yet, but then he said it. And we read it in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. But to, to be sure, the basis of that man's salvation is the same as anyone else's in any age because there's only one basis for anyone's salvation. Would you read another passage with me from the book of Romans, this time chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Having spent two and a half chapters to convince us, everybody... Everybody sinned and fallen short of the glory of God by their own choice. Paul said, beginning in verse 21 of Romans chapter 3, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus." Now, it was by Jesus' blood that there's salvation. It's by Jesus' blood that there's justification. There's righteousness for us. Well, if Jesus died that day, how did anybody who lived and died before that day ever find salvation? Justification, righteousness with God. Well, Paul's really telling us here, there's, there's blood all over the place. Jesus died according to God's purpose and foreknowledge. 
He's the Lamb, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, foreknown before the foundation of the world, redemptions in Him. How could, how did God ever really forgive anybody who lived before Jesus died on the cross? He forgave them by the blood of Christ. That's how he's the justifier, Paul said, of, of those people who have gone before. That's why he could be forbearing. He knew what he was going to do. And he's the justifier in the present by the blood of Christ of everyone who has an obedient faith in Christ. So, from that angle, you say that that thief on the cross was forgiven the same way that we are, by the blood of of Christ. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 15 through 17 helps to make things more explicit for us. A few verses earlier, the writer says that, that by means of his own blood, Hebrews 9, 12, Jesus secured an eternal redemption. But then in the beginning in verse 15, it says, therefore he's the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it's not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Now, I've been reading to you and quoting to you, especially from the New Testament, the new covenant that Jesus made in his blood when he died. But that will, the Hebrews writer said, could not have been in effect until Jesus died. So when did Jesus forgive the thief? Well, Jesus was still hanging there alive and talking to the man face to face, still under the last breaths, of the first covenant. And so whatever Jesus said to that man doesn't have a direct bearing on what he says to you and me. Since he died, there's a new covenant. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Verse 22, we'll say later in this chapter. But when and how does his blood forgive me? That's what's important today. In his three and a half years of ministry, Jesus granted forgiveness again and again, whenever, wherever, to whomever he wanted. We read in Luke chapter 5, verse 20, about a man who was brought to Jesus by friends because he couldn't get to Jesus on his own. He was paralyzed. And that story is so memorable because the house where Jesus was was so crowded that they had to go up on the roof and open up a hole and, and let him down there into the presence of Jesus. And the Bible says, seeing their faith, and it looks to me talking especially about the people who brought the man, seeing their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. That's the first thing Jesus said when the man had been lowered down through this roof and all this crowd is taken aback. Son, your sins are forgiven. Why did he tell him that? Because that's the most important thing he could do for the man. And he's the only one that could do it, forgive all his sins. And so those who opposed Jesus who are standing around said, this man's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Which was the very point that Jesus was making. And then he said, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He turned to the man and said, get up and walk. Take your bed and walk. And that's what he did. And the people who were willing to think about what they were seeing knew they'd never seen anything like this all the way around. But Jesus forgave that man that day without asking him to do anything before he forgave him. There's another example, still in the same book, Luke chapter 7, verse 48. Jesus granted forgiveness to a woman who'd lived a publicly sinful life. 
Jesus couldn't believe, or the people with Jesus, I should say, couldn't believe that he was really letting this woman even in his presence. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. There are other times in this same book of Luke where people meet Jesus and their sins are forgiven. Now, here's a question. Why does the thief get singled out out of all those people? In Luke chapter 19, verse 9, Jesus came to the house of Zacchaeus. And right after Zacchaeus had said, Lord, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, and he's admitting that he has, I'm going to restore to him fourfold. He's expressing his repentance. But Jesus said today, salvation has come to this house. For he too is a son of Abraham. There's another man who's asked the question of Jesus in Luke chapter 18. What must I do to inherit eternal life. He wants to be in that kingdom that the thief was thinking about. Don Blackwell, a gospel preacher, asked, why doesn't anybody ever say, I want to be saved the way the rich young ruler could have been saved? Well, because what did Jesus tell him? You lack one thing. You go and sell everything you have and, and give it to the poor and, and come follow me. For that man, that was key to the inheriting of eternal life. But, but nobody says, well, I want to be saved like the rich young ruler could have been saved. For whatever reason, they key in on this thief on the cross. But whoever has been saved and whoever will be saved has this in common, the washing away of their sins by the blood of Christ. So if the Bible says, and now, and now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. Why would you wait? Why wouldn't you do it? When that's what Scripture says in Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And if the Bible says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. That's what it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. And why wouldn't you walk in the light? Keep walking in the light. And always penitently confess your sin when you slip up. We're not left to wonder what to do. So that scene at the cross is not about the thief on the cross. We need to hear more about the cross of Christ on the thief. That scene where we see him is not written to tell us what to do. It's there to show us what Jesus was doing. He was there to secure forgiveness of sins for people like that criminal, for people like those mocking Jesus at the foot of the cross, for people like us, weak, ungodly sinners. I'm glad to read about the thief on the cross, but, but he's off to the side. Jesus is the one front and center, and I'm really glad to get to read about the cross on the thief and the cross on sinners like you and me because it's about the righteousness of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, and the grace of God. You want that righteousness? You want to be the recipient of that love, that mercy, and grace? Well, you know what you need to do about it. And we want to urge you, as does Jesus, to do it now. Can we be a spiritual help to you? We're singing a song to encourage you to come to the front while we stand and sing. Bar on high, under your head.